Final ending to finding a way, part one down below. Roger attempted to use the diversion to attack me once more, believing that his size would be sufficient to defeat me. I moved towards him, gave him a poke in the throat, and it abruptly stopped him. His mouth moving like a fish out of water, he remained there momentarily bewildered before slumping to the floor. Not quite grasping what had happened, he looked up at me. I said, Sarah, look away, baby girl. I gave Rogers a wind-up kick to his balls, applying as much force as I could to his neither region once she turned to face me. Breathless, he rolled to one side. Sweetie, can you please go call Zero Emergency, letting them know your dad has been attacked, and I defended us both. Can you also let them know we have a recording of the entire incident and expect both police and an ambulance here as soon as possible? I responded. Now that she had managed to escape Louise's hold, Sarah bolted back to her room and slammed the door behind her. Well done, girl. I took Roger by the ear and looked at Louise with a blazing fury in my eyes as I spoke softly into his held ear. Listen up, you took my wife and came to my house thinking I was going to be something I'm not, but now you're lying on the floor in pain, about to be arrested. You have no idea what you've unleashed or how I am going to screw up your miserable life. Think you're a big man, I've just made you a eunuch. I released his ear and let him fall to the floor. Roger collapsed, and Laos shouted, what have you done? Before running around me to get to him. Cameron, what the hell have you done to Roger? I looked at the woman who, only a few months ago, I would have sacrificed my own life for, and shrugged, even if she were on fire, I wouldn't spit on her now. Doesn't matter, Louise, tonight you and the eunuch here didn't even ask after myself or my daughters before you both laid into me. You didn't ask Sarah how she was or where any of us have been. You just went along with other man here and his agenda. She crouched over her fallen boyfriend and stared at me. There was silence for a short while, so I filled it. Not going to ask. Then let me tell you. Because you ran off with the fat guy for the weekend, our daughter and her boyfriend came to spend time with me because she's not dumb and figured out something was wrong even when I tried to deny it. Before long, Rose and Toby were here as well. Oh, Cameron, you didn't, she whimpered. No, I didn't. Carrie and Robbie did. They're smart, intelligent and knew how to read between the lines, I replied. Anyway, they came round to be there for me unlike you were, then went home later that night with a promise to bring breakfast Saturday morning while we figured out how to deal with you and lover boy here. Anyways, I blurted, aware that I was about to enter the difficult portion. My voice trailed off. Rose and Toby were on their way over here with breakfast from Mama's when they were T-boned by an out-of-control semi. Toby is dead, and Rose is fighting for her life in hospital. It's been all over the news, so if you and Nutsack here had bothered to look at the news or even ask, then you may have found out that because of you, one of our friends is dead, and another may not live. I took a time to process it, but then Louise had the audacity to growl at me. It's not my fault, Cameron. We told you to say nothing. If you had kept your mouth shut, they would be alive. It's your fault they are dead, not mine. Our daughter said, no, it's not mother, it's yours, as she stood in the doorway. She turned to face her mother after saying, police and ambulance are on their way. I have no idea who you are, but you are not my mother, it's your fault that Uncle Toby is dead, not Dad's. If you hadn't cheated on Dad, this never would have happened. She was staring at her hands. And it's my fault too. Maybe if I said something to Dad, he could have stopped this. I started to say, Sarah. She pointed at her mother and exclaimed, No Dad, I know I should have said something, but the blame lays at her feet. Louise and I exchanged blank looks as she withdrew back to her room. Now that we could hear the emergency sirens, nobody said anything until two police cars pulled up and chaos spread around the area. Louise made an attempt to clarify that I had attacked Roger. She stumbled to say that I was her husband but that I had still defeated Roger when asked whether he was. After I finished telling my side of the tale, the ambulance pulled up and a very sore Roger was placed on a stretcher. When Sarah returned to the room, my wife was once more yelling that I was to blame for everything, and I believe that the police were getting near to arresting me because I was the one who had assaulted someone. The ambulance had left. She said, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Officer, to the person doing our interview, but I have a recording here that confirms everything that my dad said, including that the man said he would kill my father and that my mom would lie to protect him against my dad. She gave a USB drive to the policeman. Louise exclaimed, what, how, Roger smashed your phone, oblivious to the fact that the police were still present and listening. Mom, Dad had a feeling that something might happen, so when I went to my room, I put my phone at the base of the door to record everything. The officer was staring at her. Sarah moved to hug me and glared at her mother, saying, I'm sorry that I have to say after hearing everything. I don't feel safe around mom. Can you please not make me stay with her? But, she did say that she would back that man up regardless of what he did to dad. I heard him hit my dad at least once. So, I'm scared. Beyond that, it was irrelevant. Sarah had evidence against Louise and had made a statement as a minor. My wife was thus detained and spent the night in the watch house. Louise gave me a sneer but remained silent as she was let out. We were too exhausted to sleep after everything, so we changed and had a shower. I got a coffee after that and then I drove back to the hospital. Carrie and Robbie were leaning on each other on a couple of chairs as we entered Rose's room. Carrie gasped when she saw my face. 
What happened, dead. She said as she noticed the bruise that had started to appear where I had been hit in the face. For the following few minutes, we explained about her mother's and Roger's visit. I went on to say that I had given him a nudge in the nuts to let him know I wasn't a cuckold. Rose's muffled grunt reached us, and her open eyes stared sorrowfully at me. I became silent, realizing that I had been partially recounting Toby's death to her. Rose, I stumbled, I'm sorry, Petal, if I had known you were awake. She was aware of my acknowledgement from earlier, of course, but even so, I ought to have been a bit more tactful. Her right arm, like the whole of her body, was covered in bandages, and at least one of her fingers was broken. Despite this, I saw her attempt to raise her hand, and I quickly responded by attempting to grab hold of it without endangering her further. I questioned, then said, Are you okay, Rose? Can I get you anything? Do you need a nurse? She blinked twice, three times slowly, but curled her unbroken fingers against my hand, and I didn't move for the remainder of the night. Give me one blink for yes, two blinks for no. The next few weeks went by extremely quickly. The day after Louise's parents bailed her out of jail, they called me derogatory names until Carrie corrected them. A few days later Louise arrived at work to find that the process server had served her divorce papers and that she had also seen the process server serve papers to the business owner. By the end of the day, Louise was living in her parents' spare room, on leave without pay, and suspended pending a review. She had come back to the house when Carrie and Robbie were sleeping. They watched her like hawks as she gathered a few things and then made the humiliating walk back to her parents' waiting car. Carrie hugged her grandparents, but she made it clear that her mother would never be allowed back in the house. Carrie believed that her mother was a shameless person after the fight with Roger and me, and that she also had blood on her hands from the accident. Even though Rose was awake, it took almost that first week before they felt comfortable taking out her breathing tube, but when they did, her first croaky words were for me. How are you doing, Cameron? Rose, how can you ask that? I recoiled. Her smile was regretful. Honey, it's okay. I was aware of Toby before you informed me. Though we were stunned but conscious in the minutes following the catastrophe, I hoped beyond hope. We declared our love for one another, yet I knew I would survive while he would not. She began to weep. After I woke up the first time, I was so out of it, but I recall your eyes confirming he was gone. I took a seat in the chair next to the bed and grasped her right hand, which was still broken but entire, unlike her missing left hand. She whispered to me in a tone full of conspiracy, even though there was only the two of us in the room at the moment. But last night, I had a dream in which Toby appeared to me and he was stunning. I stared at her, and her smile faded a little. He told me that it was all right, it was his time, the accident was no one's fault, not even Louise's, she said, grinning. He wasn't hurt and looked good. You're right, it's just like Toby to take no responsibility. Nevertheless, he declared his love for me and said that I now had a duty to take care of you. Cameron was quite saddened by what had happened to you and really loved you like a brother. Rose, you are the one who needs to be taken care of, I said, glancing at her. Really, are you really not aware that you are missing a hand? Then, with a grin, she raised her stump slightly and said, It seems like I have no arms anymore, do I? I snorted, unable to resist the urge. I suppose it's my job now to give you a hand when you need it. I replied, Cam, I mean business. Although I am really missing Toby, I feel at ease in that dream because he promised to take care of you. She grinned when I held up my hands, and I smiled back, saying, Okay, you win. Rose said smugly, You can take care of me, but only after you leave. It's my responsibility to look after you till then. The next few months passed more slowly than the first two weeks, when I wasn't working. I was either at the hospital with Rose or packing up the house at home. The girls and I had made the decision to sell the house and relocate. We found a place just outside of Crow's Nest in northern Sydney for a fair price, and we also got a good deal on our current place. The new house was smaller but still close to the medical center and transportation. It had three bedrooms plus a study nook, and from the master bedroom window, you could see Sydney Harbor in the distance if you stood on your tiptoes. The kids refused to talk to mom, and the few talks they did have with their mother did not end well for Louise. Our laid-back daughter Sarah had turned into a tough-as-nails, scowling any time her mother was brought up. My divorce from Louise was well underway. Carrie was not doing well living in her parents' house in a spare bedroom. They had called me a couple of times to see if I could reconcile. But after I played them the audio recording from that night with Roger and Louise from Sarah's phone, they apologized then stopped trying to fix our problems. Carrie had all but moved in with Robbie during the past month which I didn't mind, though Louise had called me out on it a dozen times, in between calling me a heartless cuckold and pathetic lover. If Louise's life was spiraling out of control, Rogers had fallen into a pond, literally, with a rock at the bottom. He had to have a testicles removed, and although he had sued me, the police had told him he could sue me, but it would not go well for him because I could easily defend my home and family. After only one week of review, his workplace fired him for bringing their company into such disrepute, presumably in an attempt to get me to drop the lawsuit against them but my lawyer had smelled blood in the water and was negotiating a settlement with them. Roger's wife had also obtained a copy of the tape in some way, I swear it wasn't me, but I did receive some suspicious looks from Sarah a few times, 
One evening, I received a call from a Miranda Fellworth, and for the next hour, we exchanged stories. She had suspected Roger of cheating on her before, but this was the first time she had concrete proof. It turned out that a large portion of the Fellworth fortune originated from a trust left by Miranda's grandparents. Miranda informed me that he would receive nothing from it. They had children, one of whom had aspired to be a lawyer, but Miranda suspected that might not be the case once he discovered his father's indiscretion. Now that Roger was staying in an inexpensive, pay-by-night motel with a credit card that was getting close to its maximum and was having little luck in his job search, I sincerely hoped that would remain the case. A month after the accident, Rose was improving little by little and was allowed to spend a few hours in the hospital with a nurse so that we could all say a formal goodbye to Toby. It was strange, we were all grieving, but Rose, of all people, smiled a lot, laughed with people over stories they told, and when she did cry, she always made the other person feel better about themselves. Rose's injuries were still quite severe, her legs were still in cast, she still had several bandages wrapped around her head, her left forearm was wrapped tightly, and there was a red scar running from her forehead above her left eyebrow, down over the bridge of her nose, and across her right cheek, which the doctors said would eventually fade and heal, but would require plastic surgery. Rose's nurse smiled at me, never more than a few steps away, but she deferred to me to aid Rose, so I made sure I was the one pushing her wheelchair about as she met everyone at the burial. I was working on accounts and paperwork in Rose's hospital room a month after the funeral when I felt her eyes fall on me, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up and me to put down the invoice I was working on. Petal, what is it? Are you in need of anything? I turned to face her and asked. I was taken aback as I turned to see Rose staring at me with tears flowing down her cheeks. The moment she woke up, she was worried about other people rather than herself. Cameron, I, she tried to say, but before she knew it, I was there, my arms around her. I held her while she sobbed and checked her monitors. Other than a slightly elevated heartbeat, she was fine. This was an emotional experience. The hospital psychiatrists warned that this might happen. I comforted Rose, saying, Be quiet. It will all be okay. I'm here. I've got you. You will never need to walk alone. You know that. She wept even harder, nodded, and held onto me with her bare arm. She beseeched me, I know Cameron. I just miss him, you know. I do, Rose. Trust me, I do. Toby was my best friend. I miss him. When Louise did what she did if it wasn't for you and Toby, she gave me a closer hug. She asked in a moment of pain and weakness, will it get better? I'm not sure, I said in response. I want to believe it will. Toby is gone, but you are still here, and we have our kids. That has to count for something. She remained silent for a while. She relaxed then, I sensed. She chuckled uncomfortably and whispered, thanks, Cam. I don't know if I would be able to hold it together without you. You're getting wise in your old age, you know that. I gave her hair a quick stroke, running my fingers through her thick, curly red hair, and then I leaned in to kiss her atop her hairline. You're welcome, Rose. Without Toby with us or Louise in my life, I find that I require a best friend. You interested in the job? I inquired. Rose did the last thing I expected to see, but she held me close anyhow. She kissed me with her upper hand. When I kissed her back, I discovered that I was feeling romantic love for Rose again, something I never thought I would feel. After realizing what I was doing, I withdrew. I'm sorry, Rose. You are my best friend, in fact, my oldest friend, and I adore you, but, holy crap, we're still in sorrow for Toby. We sat on her hospital bed together as she moaned and snuggled into me. I put my arm over her without thinking. I know Cam, I get what you say, but I feel something. It's never ever gone away from high school. She replied. That night I fell into a restless sleep, which I must have tossed and turned for hours before I, at last, entered what I immediately understood for some reason to be a dream. The dream was of a bar that I had never seen before, it was large, and I felt that if I tried to walk it from end to end, I would be walking for a long time. There were tables everywhere, and a lot of people were sitting and drinking, playing pool, or darts. The problem was that everyone was out of focus, I knew they were there. I even said hello to several of the people I passed, I even received greetings from the fuzzy outline of people. I got the impression that they were smiling at me, but no matter how I looked, they were still out of focus. Nevertheless, it was a pleasant dream, and I was considering walking to the bar when I spotted someone. Toby, I cried out, reaching out to give him a quick hug, but just in time, I skidded to a stop. It's good to see you to Cam, it's okay, he said, laughing at me. You are welcome to give me a hug. After we hugged, I pulled him away so he could see me examining him closely. He looked just as good as the night before the accident, so he caught me giggling once again. You look good mate, I said. For some reason, I know this is a dream, but it is so good to see you. He grinned, and we took a seat at the table. I had a Kraken and Coke in front of me, and Toby was holding a pint of Guinness. We took a time to enjoy our beverages. Ah, with a sigh, excellent stuff. He gave me a glance. Well, what's up, Cam? He inquired. My fantasy started to come true as I let go a little. Not great, mate, I responded to my best friend's dream. It hurts having Louise divorced. The girls are constantly upset. I'm making an effort to help Rose heal, but it's difficult, and I feel like I'm becoming lost in everything. Toby gave a nod. 
How about Rose and you? He raised an eyebrow and questioned. He grinned at me, maintaining the raised eyebrow, and I took a moment to sit back and consider the Toby of my dreams. How about us? I inquired. Go on, Cam. I can't even begin to count the years that we have been friends. You and Rose have something about each other that would make anyone blush, and you are my closest friend. You two are in love, I know that. Of course, Toby, she is as close to me as you and Louise were, I snorted. She's become my best friend in the absence of the two of you from my life. My wish is for her to recover. I get that, Cam, he groaned. But you can't argue that the kiss you had this afternoon, which kept you up all afternoon before you went to sleep and came here, meant nothing. Naturally, in order to make me feel bad about kissing his wife, my mind would conjure up an imaginary scene in which my best friend was hurling him at me. I know it was more than nothing, Toby, I said, glancing at my companion. I was terrified and said, mate, Rose was married to you, Louise to me, sure we dated and even gave each other our first, but Toby, that's your wife we're talking about. He grinned at me and said, I love her, I always have. In what way can I deceive you with her? Cameron, he uttered gravely, I'm dead, he said in a somber yet decisive tone. The two of you can't cheat on me, Rose, like you, has so many more years left in her. She needs someone that will love her and protect her as much as I did. Look Cameron, you said it yourself, Louise is out of your life now or soon will be, and you do love Rose. For a few period, he gazed at me, and I had the impression that this was not just a dream but rather the real Toby considering what was vital to say. Rose loves you too, Cameron. Sure, she's hurting from my death, but she is desperately holding on to hope that you won't abandon her. In her heart, she holds you dear with the same type of love she does for me. Indeed, she may love you more than me as you have known her so much longer. I mean that. I wasn't sure what to say. You know, Rose was going to find you and force you into marriage if we hadn't met when you two were apart. He leaned in as if he was ready to reveal something important to me. I practically spluttered in my rum, asking, what? How in the hell would you know that? He grinned, she told me. I was horrified by my best friend's dream. How could she tell you? You're just some dream of my best friend that for some reason my slumbering mind is using to help me process everything. Rose never said anything to me about that, so how could you know? Toby chuckled. Cam, look around you at the walls, at this pub. This isn't just a dream, and I'm not just a figment of your exhausted mind. He said. B.S., I answered. He informed me. Cam, it's true. I'll prove it to you. How? Was my skeptical response. He extended three fingers. He said, his tone lighthearted, three ways. First, he said, pointing to his index finger. When you get to hospital tomorrow, ask Rose what the final words I told her were. I grumbled, I already know that. You were in the car and told each other you love each other. Toby shook his head and grinned. Well, it's sort of true, but after that, when both of us knew I wasn't going to make it, I grew calm. Somehow, I knew Rose would see the next day, and my dying words were, love Cameron for all your days. As I was about to respond, Toby held up his hand and extended two fingers. Secondly, Louise is going to show up at the hospital tomorrow. It won't be attractive. Toby, there is no way. Third, he added, interrupting me again while pointing to three fingers. My mother is going to get you and Rose one of those delicious chicken salad sandwiches from the Asian sandwich shop on North Harbor to let you know she was thinking of you both while traveling. She's going to wear sandals in yellow. My companion laughed at me once again as I stared at him. Toby, how are you aware that you are dead and that this is a dream? I informed my pal. Like it was a secret, he touched the side of his nose. He informed me, to be honest, I'm not allowed to say this, but it's a miracle that I was able to meet with Rose and you at all. But I am because I was invited to meet with you. Being able to spend more time with you makes me happy. Even though I didn't believe him, I had to confess that I was relieved to see him. So, what should I do, marry her, if that's how everything turns out? I inquired. Picking up his drink and tugging me out of the booth to a dartboard, Toby laughed once more. That's up to you, my friend, but if you did marry Rose, you would have my blessing. Now that is something I couldn't say while I was alive. But regardless matter what you decide, Cam, I'm proud to be your best friend. Love her fiercely. For the better part of an hour, Toby and I played darts, drank, and at one point, I think we sang bar songs. A few other customers joined us, though I can't remember them clearly. Other than one guy, who seemed like he was important to the establishment or something. But as we drank and danced, the pub gradually disappeared from view. As we said our goodbyes, Toby leaned over and hugged me. I was happy and sad at the same time, and I even got to say goodbye this time. So I woke up with hot tears running down my cheeks. My assistant had all my papers ready for the day, accepted the ones I worked on yesterday, and ushered me into a meeting room where I worked with my floor managers for an hour before heading to the hospital. By the time I was dressed and shaved, I had mostly forgotten the dream. I stopped at the office to check in with my managers, as everyone knew I was going to be working a lot from Rose's hospital room as well as finalizing moving house in the coming weeks. Although there was still much work to be done, the doctors had informed her that she would be able to return home in a few weeks. She had been complaining for a few days now that she was sick of her hospital bed and that even though they had managed to get her a bed with a window, she just wanted to be outside of the four walls. 
We were talking about her going to bed when Toby's mother Camilla entered the room. I didn't know Camilla as well as Rose's mother Edwina, but we were casual acquaintances. She smiled. I was excited for her since getting her situated at home would help her a lot. You look so much better today, Rose, she observed in a kind and cheerful voice. And Cameron, you look so handsome and dashing. To take such fantastic care of Rose, you are so amazing. As she leaned over to kiss Rose, I noticed that she was wearing yellow sandals. I froze, and Rose noticed the blood drain from my cheeks. I know Toby would be so proud of you, she added. What is it, Cam? Rose and her mother-in-law both glanced in Camilla's direction, where I was staring. Is there a problem with the cam on my shoe? I picked them up yesterday on special, scowled Camilla. Rose kept staring at me for a minute while Camilla cried, so I responded. No, sorry, Camilla. It was a dream last night, your shoes just reminded me, that's all, attempting to push the thought from my mind. Oh, and before I forget, I got lunch for you too at that fantastic Asian sandwich store in North Harbor. They make the most amazing chicken sandwiches with everything you can hold in two hands for just six dollars, she exclaimed, beaming with excitement. I sat down and mouthed the words chicken sandwiches along with Camilla. Cam, how are you doing? With concern, Rose inquired. I glanced at Rose, then Camilla, then the sandwiches she was removing from their packaging for us, and finally her yellow sandals. I tried to convince myself that it was merely a dream, that it was a silly dream. We ate our sandwiches, and Camilla was right, they were terrific. Imagine layer after layer of chicken, lettuce, tomato, cheese, beetroot, pineapple, salt, pepper, and a fantastic fruit relish placed between two pieces of very soft but crusty bread, and I tried to excuse myself by telling both ladies that I was just tired. Camilla didn't know me well enough to object, but Rose did give me a look that said we would talk about it later. I started to relax, no longer frightened, now relaxing into a post-lunch quiet as Louise strode into the room after lunch, and we sat around talking about nothing, mostly the weather and how we were going to get Rose home. If I had to admit it, Louise looked good, maybe a little leaner than when I last saw her, but good nonetheless. She carried a bunch of flowers and a wrapped gift, but she waltzed in like she was supposed to be there, walking as if the previous few months had never happened. Her outfit was jeans and a blouse, her hair up in a bun. It's wonderful to see you, Rose. All things considered, you look good, Laos remarked, looking around the room before her entire demeanor abruptly shifted upon seeing me. Cameron, she growled, why are you here? You are to blame for Toby's death and Rose's presence. It is not right for you to be here. When I'm through with the divorce, I'll see to it that Rose is taken care of so she won't have to see your ugly face ever again. I got up, clouds of thunder were building. Leave. Everyone turned to face the bed where Rose was sobbing, turning their heads to face the window as a tiny voice spoke up. Don't worry, Rose. Cameron may leave here, I promise, Louise murmured. She responded, her tears trickling down her cheeks. No, he stays, you go. I stepped in Louise's direction. I sternly stated, Louise, you need to go. Listen for once. You must go now. Louise flung the present on the floor, making a loud smashing sound, and then she tossed the flowers against the wall. I moved to put myself between Louise and Rose, lying on the bed, while Camilla watched in disbelief. What the hell, Cameron? What the hell did you say to her? Yelled Louise in a fury. Does she not realize that you are to blame for Toby's death? How in the world could she possibly believe that I am connected to you or her accident? The one who has to go is you. And with her lost hand, I'll be happy to make sure she is looked after, she said, glancing down at Rose's stump where her left hand had been. I'll look after Rose, I'll stay with her making sure she's all right now she's lost her husband. I growled, what the hell makes you think you can walk in here after over two months without a word and think that you have any right whatsoever to talk with Rose? Kim. Rose has lost her husband, I have lost my best friend, and the kids and I have been here every day since the accident, I said, gesturing to the bed behind me. Have you been somewhere? I began to roar. Cameron, repeated the voice. I continued, I know why you're here, you've lost your job, your parents are tired of you in their spare bedroom, your daughters won't talk to you, so you thought that you would manipulate Rose to trying to live off her until she tires of your BS. Hello, Cameron. I wheeled on Rose, furious at being stopped only to find my best friend staring at me with adoration, and my fury instantly melted. Rose's voice said a third time, insistent. With regret, I muttered. It's okay, Rose said again, glaring at Louise with her full attention. Louise, you should go. Your behavior toward Cameron and the recent tantrum you had are unacceptable. It demonstrates your lack of friendship with me, and you have no right to blame Cameron by using Toby's passing as a crutch. Over the years, you have turned into an abhorrent and repulsive being. I am embarrassed to have ever called you a friend, much less confide in you. Rose pointed at Laos's stump as she began to object. Louise, save it, you're not coming to stay at my house. You are not welcome here, and I am no longer your friend. Do you need to be escorted out, or do I need to call security? Rose questioned my soon-to-be ex-wife. Louise begged, that's not fair, Rose. Nobody is listed. No Louise, Rose cut in, her voice vehement with a hint of rage. It's not fair that my husband is dead and I am permanently crippled because you chose to mistreat your husband, who is among my closest friends. 
The room fell silent, the only sounds emanating from the hallway. Louise wore a scowl that I had come to associate with her denial of everything around her and with life itself. She looked from Rose to me, back to Rose, to me again, and then back to Rose one last time, her expression shifting with a range of emotions. But the scowl remained, and as she looked at Rose that final time, Venom was unleashed. Well, screw you, Rose. I understand how things are, and your husband is still alive and well, even if you are his spouse. You woman of hypocrisy. Well, you can shove any help I was going to give you, she growled. Louise didn't finish as I took her by the elbow and pulled her from the room. I dragged Louise with me as I slammed fire doors open once more and headed down the corridor in the direction of the nearest outside access. Luckily, those weren't alarm doors. Louise continued to yell back towards Rose's hospital room while sputtering and swearing. Security wouldn't be far away, I knew. I turned to face my errant spouse. Louise, I don't know what the hell is wrong with you. I don't know what flipped your switch from a loving wife and caring friend to woman from hell, but it stops right now. I snapped at her. Thankfully, Louise stopped talking and shrank back. She said, Cameron. No, Louise, you are done. You've broken every relationship around you, from your daughters to your friends to me. No one, and I do mean no one wants you within a hundred meters of us. You've become a narcissistic woman who appears to care nothing for anyone around you. When the doors opened, two large security guards emerged and saw Louise and me. Peter asked the larger of the two security officers, You all right there, Mr. Other? Fine Peter, Louise here just got a little emotional and upset at seeing Rose laid up in a hospital bed. However, she was just leaving, weren't you Louise? I stared at her before waving him away. My words did not deceive security, who were prepared to remove Louise. Rather, she glanced at me before the guards shook their heads. She answered, Sure, I'll see you later, Cameron. I hope not, I said, shaking my head. The three of us observed Louise go. Then they led me back into Rose's chamber, where Rose whispered to Camilla. Security departed after confirming Rose was okay. The cleaners arrived to tidy up the mess from the event, and 20 minutes later, Camilla left as well, hugging me tightly. Camilla hugged me and said, Thank you, Cameron. Now you look after her, she needs you, before running to catch her ride home. When it was only the two of us, I sat down on Rose's bed and asked, Are you okay? I took hold of her right hand and held it. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be asking you? She growled. I gave a shrug. It's been a strange day, but just now with Louise, I felt, I don't know, settled. But, no, I guess it started with that dream last night. Rose snapped her head to face me, asking, Dream. I blushed and agreed, yeah, I couldn't sleep last night when I got home, thinking that our kiss had some part in the situation. Anyway, I couldn't sleep, I tossed and turned, but when I did sleep, I had a dream about Toby in a pub. Rose gave a nod, perhaps comprehending. It was strange. It was like I knew it was a dream and it was a big pub, there were other people there, but it was like. Rose concluded for me, saying, they were out of focus. I believe my surprise came through as her eyes searched mine. Yeah, they were out of focus, well, except for Toby and some other guy. I can't recall the other guy, but Toby was crystal clear, we talked. He told me things that would happen today to know it was more than a dream, Camilla's shoes, the sandwiches, Louise turning up. Toby said they would all happen. My eyes met Rose's, and she seemed to believe me. She timidly said, there was one more, wasn't there? I gave a nod, how was she aware? She let go of a tear and clutched my hand as I glanced at her. I was afraid of what the question would signify, therefore I didn't want to ask it. Rose said, quietly but intently, love Cameron for all your days, meeting my eyes. I took a deep breath. Rose, I inquired. She nodded, the tear slowly moving down her face to join the last one. Those were the last words that Toby said to me before we both passed out in the car wreck. They were the last words that he spoke to me in this life. I croaked out, how did you know? As my tears joined hers, silently, almost inaudibly. Toby in the pub, when you told me I knew. He also met me there, telling me how brave I was but that I would need to let go and love you like I always have. He told me that you would be unable to ask the question when it was time but that I should tell you our final words. And with that, we collapsed into each other's arms, me around Rose in the last of the afternoon light as we sobbed. We talked softly about the man we knew, the buddy, the lover, the spouse, and the father, while we were crying. We grew closer to one another as we grieved our shared loss together. As night fell and the hospital sounds enveloped us, Rose cleared a spot for me on the tiny hospital bed, and we kept holding each other tightly as we could, feeling unexpectedly exhausted. Eventually, I whispered a kiss on her head as we drifted off to sleep. I love you, Petal. Rose gave a small sniff in return and said, I love you too, Cam. Things became simpler for us gradually after that day. The next morning, we were discovered by Sarah, Carrie, and Robbie's children curled up on the bed beneath a hospital blanket that someone had evidently put over us in the middle of the night by a nurse. When we awoke, Sarah clapped, and everyone stood and stared at us as we slept. I stood up and stretched, giving Rose a soft peck on the lips. Carrie gave Robbie a kiss and grinned. The majority of yesterday's events were explained to Louise during the morning, omitting the section regarding the dream with Toby. Everyone agreed later that week that Rose would live with Sarah and I instead of returning home after being freed. 
Since our new location was nearer the hospital, we decided that Carrie and Robbie would stay at Rose's house, with our consent of course, rent out the other two rooms to other university students. When Rose was finally allowed to go, the formal casts had been replaced with some hard fabric casts that she could take off as needed to keep healing. Rose was mostly accepting of her condition, even though it was sad to see the stump where her left forearm had been. The flesh surrounding the stump was developing well. Furthermore, Rose's fractured skull has healed. Luckily, other than a little concussion they treated in the hospital, there were no after effects. One of the best days we've all had in a long time was getting her home. To be quite honest, when my new girlfriend moved in with me, I was also a little wild. Rose and I had gone from kissing to a light petting since that night in the ICU. I was afraid to hurt her, therefore I was hesitant to move forward. Nevertheless, Rose's doctors informed her that if she returned home, albeit cautiously for the first several months, she could continue a full connection after observing our blossoming relationship and learning about our past. Many of Rose's clothes and personal items had already been carried to the new home by the kids, who had even assumed too much and put them in the master bedroom with mine rather than the spare room as we had discussed. To be honest, though, I didn't find the maneuver offensive. After supper, Carrie and Robbie left to return to Rose's old place, and Sarah made reasons to go to a friend's place down the road for a few hours, leaving Rose and me alone for the first time of the day. We spent a few hours talking with the kids when we came home. Cameron. Yes, my pedal. I answered, referring to her by my pet moniker. I know we need to take our time, but I haven't had any release in months. Would you be able to help me to the bedroom and give me a hand? She replied with a smile. Of course, my love. I grinned and gave her a hand up right away. With me supporting her under her left arm and a crutch under one, we headed for the bedroom. I unfastened one leg brace, then the other, as I carefully assisted her to the bed. I got a washcloth out of the connected bathroom and got to work cleaning her up. She let out a satisfied sigh, and I helped her take a shower. After giving her and myself a gentle wash, I put us both to bed and we fell asleep in each other's arms. The aroma of food wafted through the door in the morning, waking us up. A few moments later, Carrie came waltzing in, her hand in front of her face. Cover up, you too, I'm coming in. She exclaimed, letting go of her hand as she noticed that we were both grinning and hidden beneath the sheet. She questioned, sleep well. Wow, my love, a drowsy rose answered. She abruptly stood up, the sheet falling away to reveal her ample bust, saying, it feels so good to sleep in a normal bed again. She turned to face me, and to sleep beside someone you love. After blushing slightly, Carrie chuckled. We both flushed a deep crimson as Rose pulled up the sheet. Rose, don't be. You are amazing. I hope mine are as firm as yours when I'm your age, she said, glancing at me. I know my dad loves them already, I mean again. Carrie quickly shifted the subject, saying, you know what I mean. Breakfast is ready, Sarah and Robbie are setting up now, so I was designated to come and see if you needed any help getting ready since we figured you would both be bare. She cracked a grin. No, it's all right, sweetie, Rose and I can get dressed, I'll help her down in a couple of minutes. Be a good girl and close the door on the way out. I said, yes, dad. She laughed, closed the door, and walked out while emulating a salute. After we made it down, after ten or so minutes, they were all laughing. The remainder of the morning was laid back, everything felt right, as if our new family had always been together forever, which I guess it had. There was the easy feeling of a family being themselves, we had known each other for ages. A few weeks later Louise and I officially divorced, and our assets were divided. Louise received very little because of the prenuptial agreement. She was kept out of my business, which was highly valuable. A little under half of our total savings, $40,000, was the amount I handed her, even though I didn't have to, from the sale of our first house. You might wonder why I did that since the prenup would have just required me to give her around half of that. That was, in fact, for two reasons. Firstly, Louise's actions had destroyed our relationship. My intention was to provide her with sufficient funds to enable her to leave her parents' house and establish a new life elsewhere. We wouldn't have to see her again since, according to rumors I had heard, she had been offered a position in Wollongong. I thought that giving her that money would help her make that decision. I wasn't short on cash, either, because the amount I handed her included a zero from my settlement with her former employer to conceal her and Roger's romance. Regarding Roger, it seems that he has encountered some difficulties. He sold narcotics for a dealer after failing to find employment, and during his first week of sales, he sold to an undercover police officer. As a result, he is currently serving a two-year sentence for trafficking. If you ask me, it couldn't have happened to a more likable guy. Rose and I tied the knot six months later. With a bouquet covering her stump, she looked stunning in her wedding gown. She experienced multiple episodes of sadness, but they never persisted for very long because the kids and I were constantly present. She was self-conscious about the way she looked. Rose changed careers as well. After earning a degree in psychology, she began to coach other people who had lost limbs, just as she had. 
She received recognition from the government in the Australia Day Awards two years after our marriage for her efforts to assist the underprivileged who have disabilities. She brought me up on stage with her after thanking her family and friends in her speech, describing me as the primary reason for her success because I supported her as she got over her injury. It was a hectic moment. Rose and I participated in multiple media appearances. We even appeared on a few morning shows to discuss the emotional and psychological difficulties faced by people who have physical disabilities. Despite her disability, my wife was stunning and never allowed people to see her upset or in tears. Even so, she knew that I would be there to support her in getting back up when she fell. Even though Rose and I occasionally disagreed, we always forgave one another and never went to bed feeling angry with one another. Our love for one another deepened every day. After the award, Louise disappeared for around three years. It was the wedding of Robbie and Carrie. They now had excellent professions after graduating from college with honors in their chosen field, but they still desired to establish a family while they were still young. Since their two conversations over the previous three years had been brief and unpleasant, Carrie didn't want to extend an invitation to her mother. But for no other reason than Louise gave birth to Carrie and ought to be able to enjoy that, I persuaded her to invite her. Carrie gave up at last, but only after insisting that Louise sit at a table with other regulars, not her family. I gave a shrug. As long as my ex-wife wasn't seated next to Rose and me, I didn't care where she was seated. All I wanted to do was make sure Carrie never looked back in the future and wished her mother had been present for her wedding. There was a compromise in the end. Louise eventually took a seat with her elderly parents, who were content to remain a few tables away to maintain harmony with their granddaughter and her new spouse. I was at the bar, having a kraken and a coke, as is always the case with ex-wives at weddings. Louise strolled over, leaning on the bar next to me, and said that even though it wasn't on the tab, since I was paying, I could have anything I wanted. After giving me an order for a glass of white wine, she turned to face me. She asked me directly, I never said I was sorry, did I? But it was more of a declaration than a query. Nope, I replied, pirouetting around to face the throng. Carrie, Sarah, and Rose were giggling over something across the room. I grinned. But then again, I never thought you would, I concluded my conversation with her. Louise sighed. You're right. I was a mess back then, a complete and utter mess entirely of my own making, she replied. I answered, yep, pronouncing the final sound and took a sip of my beverage. Rose turned to face me, grinned, then scowled as she noticed Louise standing next to me. I shook my head slightly, and she nodded, understanding that nothing was wrong. I saw you both at the Australia Day Awards and followed what you have both achieved since then, Louise stated with sadness. She was aware that she would never be able to experience a relationship like that with either of her girls again as she saw my wife, her former friend, giggle with our girls. Louise looked at them, then at me, then down into her wine glass. She hates me. They all do, don't they? Hate is a strong word to use Louise. After some thought, I laughed. No, actually, it's an apt word for what they think of you. But as time goes by, the fire dies down. In another decade, who knows, the girls might pick up a phone call from you. I felt Louise's shoulder slump more than I saw it. She turned to face me then. My ex-wife asked, what about you, Cameron? Do you hate me? I gave a shrug. I heard the band begin to tune their instruments in the background as they said, hate, loathe, despise, take your pick. I gave myself a small smile. I would be dancing with my kids soon. But you convinced Carrie to invite me tonight. So if you hate me that much, why? The first time I had glanced at Louise all night, I turned to face her. She had changed from the person I knew to someone who was hollowed out. Her butt had swollen out, but her cheeks were noticeable, as if she wasn't eating properly. Her hair appeared to be receding slightly, rather than merely growing gray or being overdyed, giving her eyes a haunted appearance. All in all, I understood that this lady I had loved was damaged. I gave her one more look before responding. Louise, no mother should have to miss her daughter's wedding, even if she was a disgraceful woman. But I didn't invite you here to make you feel better. I invited you to make sure our daughter would have a clear conscience going into her own marriage. I stopped and gave my drink to a nearby pair. That's all, and if I never have to see you again, I'll count myself a fortunate man. I then turned to leave and went to the wedding dances with my family. I did hear her cry and say, I'm sorry, but sadly, her actions didn't elicit any pity. We laughed and joked, danced, and spent the remainder of the night together, but I never saw Louise again. Her parents did inform us that Louise passed away a few years later. Sarah had recently become engaged to a physician. Yes, surprise. I didn't anticipate that. However, it was during Sarah's engagement party that we learned Louise had an infected ovarian cyst and died in a hospital bed, her parents by her side. It was quite sad that she hadn't wanted anyone to say anything to us. For our part, Rose and I were honest with one another. Together, we showered our grandchildren with love when they were born. We traveled the globe, taking in the sights and marvels. We spoiled our grandkids and even our future great-grandkids while making love in many different locations. Even if growing older causes our body to slow down, there have been several times when we have been caught by a family member doing something inappropriate. However, nobody ever voiced a complaint. 
They were aware that Rose and I were in a relationship and that our love had remained constant over time. That was recently demonstrated by several elderly people having some risque fun. I realized I was going to get lucky tonight and that I would be loved till the day I die when I looked at my rose petal. I saw the girl I fell in love with when I was 18, the woman I married in my 40s, and the mischievous smile on the granny who was getting close to 82. My comment, when she's first leaving the house it seems like she's at least considering stopping and still has at least a little feeling for him, but when he talks to her later she becomes a psycho. It's like unreal, but I have seen it so many times around me. Do you guys agree? Comment down below, sub and bell and I will see you in the next one.